So yes, uh, thanks Steph, very much for coming and welcome to uh, this uh, inaugural uh, Warwick University's Summit. Uh, as been said, my name is Alex Bowles, I'm the Executive Director of the 1994 Group, uh, which essentially represents a group of 11 uh, research intensive universities and primarily uh, sort of the, the board is made up of the, the Vice Chancellors. And having previously worked at, uh, uh, at NUS, it's always quite interesting to see the, uh, uh, the different perspectives which uh, different parts of the AT sector are able to, uh, uh, to come to various different uh, policy debates and uh, uh, it's quite interesting to see the, the round of uh, being able to sort of get a, a perspective from, from both sides, uh, uh, so to speak. I was asked to sort of say a little bit about uh, sort of why I'm interested in higher education. I suppose I graduated uh, uh, a while ago, pretty much ever since then I've been involved in higher education policy in some way, shape, or form. And I suppose, getting too cliche, but this time on a Saturday morning, it is very much about being really passionate about education, the power of education to actually transform people's lives. I think certainly just thinking about uh, myself, uh, I don't get to university yet, pretty much went to university because I quite enjoyed the subjects I was studying at, uh, at school, pretty much expected to, uh, people in my class or went to university, didn't really think about it. Uh, but actually then thinking about the person that I was when I went to university, and actually the person that I was three years later when I graduated, the, the, sort of the gulf in the difference <coughs> between the, 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 the person that I was, just sort of helps to sort of, sort of sum up to me the, the power that education really can have to, uh, uh, to transform people's lives, and particularly sort of their horizons, being able to uh, get outside that sort of very narrow little box only that I went into uh, uh, to university with, and uh, both in terms of uh, different people from this country, but also different people from uh, across the globe, and so sort of that, that impact of uh, internationalization and mixing with people from across the world, being able to challenge your views and perspectives, I think is so important in terms of what higher education is and does. I think it's sometimes quite easy when we're Certainly, as policymakers going along to the Treasury and sort of saying, yes, we must invest in higher education because it uh, creates £59 billion for the UK economy and it helps drive innovation and all these sort of massively important facts. But actually, what is key to higher education is actually the transformational effect that it can actually have on the individuals that partake in it. And so I think it's important never to forget actually, it is very much around the individuals that are going. And, as great as the higher education system is, let's never lose sight of actually the impact that it can have on individuals. But I suppose it'd be interesting just if you yourself want to have a little think about why did you go to university? What was it that uh, first persuaded you that, yes, I, I don't know, I've got to finish school or whatever, I want to, want to go to university? But actually then think about what you were thinking then and what you think now. Has your view changed? How, how, much has, uh, how much has your perception of both you yourself, but also of higher education more generally, how has that changed? So I want you to also stand up and go and speak to someone that you've never spoken to before. So I think actually the thing about these events is it's great sort of uh, coming in and sitting next to the person that uh, you, you know quite well and, uh, and, and so on. But actually the, the great thing about these events is actually having a chance to meet other people uh, and discuss other views. So just have a, a, a little sort of stand up for a couple of minutes and just sort of have a chat with someone that you've never met before and think and talk through why you went to university and how have your perceptions changed since then. Oh. Well, for, for all of you, has, has your perception changed? Have you yourself changed? So sort of hearing sort of little snippets of what people were saying, did it feel like there was uh, uh, I was also talking about some more confidence and uh, uh, the ability to sort of understand yourself and these kind of questions. And I suppose I said, it's key to think about these kind of aspects and ensuring we keep these uh, in our minds as well. It's, it's all very easy talking about sort of the grand challenges facing higher education, but we must always remember the individual themselves. One of the, the other jobs that I did, uh, I, was, uh, I spent three years uh, in Brussels as the Secretary General of the European Students Union. I'm sorry about that way. Uh, it's sometimes quite easy in the UK when we talk about internationalisation and there's sometimes this perception that internationalisation is primarily about getting more international students to study here in the UK. But actually, having been based in Brussels and looking at uh, sort of the impact internationalisation can have on European uh, higher education systems, how many of you have heard of the Bologna process? A few. 
uh, I think that's probably the fact that uh, uh, there were uh, quite a few uh, uh, students from uh, across Europe uh, uh, here today. You don't normally get sort of quite that many uh, uh, students uh, be able to uh, that have heard of it, but essentially it's creating a European higher education area. I think what's been fascinating looking at that process is that actually internationalisation, particularly in that process, felt as though there was two driving two drivers almost sort of contradictory. There was this this, this drive towards sort of harmonisation, so having fairly similar structures, so creating a, a bachelor's, a master's, a doctorate, which in many parts of Europe they just didn't have, but actually at the same time having increasing divergence across European systems as well. So it's interesting looking at the, the power that a process like the Bologna process, which for me is one of the epitomes of what internationalisation can achieve, it's interesting the power that internationalisation can have in terms of in many European countries fundamentally changing that higher education system. But I think looking more generally in terms of uh, the global higher education system, just look at higher education now as opposed to 10 years ago, like in terms of this conference we're looking at 2025, how will the global higher education system be different then than it is now? So <coughs> looking at the major, uh, the rise in major uh, powers, particularly in terms of China, I think it's, I think it's something like building 800 universities a year, or something terrifying in terms of the number of universities and the amount of investment that they're actually uh, putting into higher education, which obviously the, the massive expanding middle class is, is totally understandable. But how will that then impact on the rest of the uh, global higher education systems? How will they sort of interrelate uh, in the future? And I think these are some, some of the kinds of questions that will be sort of useful to tease out uh, or think on during the rest of the day. But I suppose also in terms of some of the grand challenges, it's sometimes quite easy to think about, uh, we know there are massive issues facing the world, whether it's climate change or food security or uh, water security or whatever these issues happen to be. And so in terms of undertaking the research to actually be able to, to answer or uh, to challenge some of these uh, questions, is one country or one university ever going to be able to effectively answer that those questions? And certainly if we look at just one example in CERN, actually the CERN is very much coming together of academics from across European countries and across European universities. So will there be in the future more collaboration across borders rather than simply sort of either within institutions or indeed within, uh, within individual countries? <coughs> What will be the future of internationalization on the impact of research when actually it will be incredibly easy to communicate with other countries? So, yeah, internationalization, I think, should be one of the, the, the key themes in terms of uh, the, the future. It's certainly been, been interesting in terms of my own uh, path over the last uh, uh, few years. In terms of the, the day itself, today, I say it's fantastic that uh, uh, this event is being organised uh, jointly by the university and also the, uh, the Students' Union. I think particularly in terms of the, the ever-increasing role that students are expected to, uh, to, to play in terms of, uh, of higher education, the cliche about some students at the heart of the system. I think it's fantastic that, that uh, the Student' Union is actually sort of organising events like this and actually sort of trying to engage students in these discussions. I shouldn't be surprised, it's something that uh, uh, or it's new, we've been doing uh, uh, quite well for a long time in terms of engaging students. But actually, these kind of things, engaging students uh, in sort of big challenges, I think is, is fantastic. But also then, the, the way in which this event itself is going to feed into uh, the Global University Summit. I think sort of one of the outputs of today is going to be uh, a policy document which is going to be presented to the Global University Summit, which is uh, an event alongside the G8 uh, ministers meeting in the summer. In terms of the event itself today, I think we're looking at uh, what will universities look like in 2025? And to look at that, we've got a range of uh, topics during the day. So we've got uh, uh, a great session next looking at uh, immigration. We've got sessions on the, uh, the graduate job market, on uh, the, the value of uh, degrees, uh, and so on during the day. So I think we should really be able to tease out some of these, these questions. But I think before I sort of give thoughts about what I think how education might look like in 2025. Just want you to sort of take a minute or two and write down, write yourself a little note, whether on this paper or on your iPhone or whatever, about what you think how education is going to look like in 2025. 
And then at the end of this conference, uh, I want you to have a look at it again. And has your perceptions changed because of what you've heard? So a little sort of minute and a half just to sort of write down a couple of thoughts about what you think higher education might look like in 2025. Okay, I hope you've had a chance to put down at least a, a couple of thoughts about what you think education might look like in 2025. I've seen that's back to the future. I know what it's going to be like. We've all got our hoverboards, so we're all going to be uh, uh, gliding around uh, campus and so on. Or so we, we'll have a sort of chip where we're going to insert it into our brains to sort of download the information or sort of have these goggles and we're going to be able to interact with students. Uh, you know, sort of virtual world of tutorials with students from across the globe. How many of you sort of put something that's going to be in your little notes, how many of you put something that is going to be radically different to what you think it is now? So, or brave enough to put a hand. What, what, what do you think higher education might be like in 2025? Yeah, so I think it's, uh, it's telling that we use the language of higher education instead of university or college. <laughs> and so the two major trends that I, I might be able to predict, the first might be the fact that a lot of the learning might be occurring online and through uh, technology that doesn't require students to be actually in a physical lecture room or classroom. And the other one is the, this idea that degrees are losing their meaning to a lot of uh, employers in the future. And so the, the shift might be to, uh, towards a lot more technical types of accreditation or uh, some sort of uh, certificate that would say that you learn the amount of information that you need to learn to get a job, but not necessarily have a bachelor's or a master's degree. Uh, and so that would be able to sort of bridge the gap between employability and higher education. Cool. Anyone else want to chip in there? It is interesting, 20, 2025, what's that? 12 years in the future? I think about 12 years ago, that was pretty much when I was at university and thinking back to my own experience, how was I taught? I essentially had lectures, had small group tutorials, went to the library. It doesn't actually feel very different now than it did then. Now, also higher education is something that evolves now. Of course there are differences now than there were then <coughs> in terms of the use of uh, technology. But there is something about, yes there is this potential vision of something which is going to be radically different, where we are all going to be learning online or uh, in virtual worlds or whatever. But equally, there is something pretty enduring about the sort of tra traditional model uh, of higher education. And so it'll be interesting to sort of see where we end up. It probably won't be at either end, but actually it'll be sort of probably somewhere uh, along that spectrum. But I think one of the things which is quite interesting, I think, is sort of the fact that there are I think, probably two major uh, disruptive influences that there could be, and technology is absolutely uh, the key one at the moment. If we look at sort of the half-life for technology, actually, so, was it, it used to take six years for uh, the memory size of a uh, USB stick or whatever to, to double, or to, uh, to, uh, to double. Now it's pretty much six months. Technology is increasing at a uh, a massive speed, and certainly recently we've heard an awful lot of talk about MOOCs and the massively on, uh, open online uh, courses, and it, it feels like increasing numbers of universities, and, uh, as I said, how does one say it? Good universities without uh, sort of like theory of but it, it feels like a lot of very good universities and very traditional universities are getting involved in online learning in a way that they probably haven't done previously. So there is definitely something around the impact that technology may have. I would say, may it may not, but I think there is something there which has the potential to, to radically disrupt the sort of slow evolutionary pace that sometimes happens uh, within higher education, certainly just in terms of the uh, point about research that I was making earlier. Actually, if you are now able to easily communicate with people in different cities and different universities and different countries across the globe very easily, actually, if your network expands globally, why would you simply just communicate or build networks with the person in the room next door or the university down the road? Actually, I think networks uh, 
will I think be very different in the future. And so this idea of sort of partnerships and research collaboration, I think, might look quite different in the future. I think the other major potential uh, major disruptive influence is this question of the market. Uh, and it's an interesting one. It, it does feel certainly as though the governance reforms of the last few years have essentially had sort of two key aims for that. And the first one is essentially trying to create a diversity of providers. So the UK system has some 167 higher education institutions, probably several hundred uh, further education colleges delivering higher education. And actually the government reforms seem to be increasing the pace towards diversification. So more higher education delivered in further education, more online providers, but actually more private providers as well. So it's, it seems like sort of one of the, the key drivers of the government reforms are actually about creating more competition between institutions as a way of increasing, uh, ideally as a way of increasing uh, quality, but sort of seeing diversity, diversification as one of the key drivers towards that. And it's also quite interesting just looking back uh, even last summer at some of the, the application rates to institutions, and it did feel as though reforms probably had a bigger effect more quickly than I think people were expecting, and particularly in terms of, even just anecdotally, hearing about applications to particular courses in, in institutions. I say anecdotally, it was those courses which were in the top 10 on the league tables that were actually pretty much okay and doing very well in terms of applications, and those that weren't uh, seen as quite so such high quality that were struggling. So will that also be a driver towards institutions concentrating on what it is they do well. Just some things to, uh, to think about. I suppose sort of the other key point in terms of the market is very much this uh, idea that I said on the, uh, the white paper is called students at the heart of the system. So essentially trying to empower students themselves to, through their expectations, drive change within institutions. And that's why I think it's sort of, uh, such a, a great event today, actually being able to discuss with student leaders uh, from across, uh, across the globe, I believe we have the uh, people here uh, today. Actually, what does that mean in reality? It's very easy sometimes to talk about, oh, yes, students are consumers, they're going to demand more. But what does that actually mean in terms of whether students will actually know what to ask for, not least? So one of the, the big debates in the UK is the question of contact hours. And it's very easy for students to say, yes, we want more contact hours and so on would that actually improve their learning? It's very easy for universities to stick on lots of three in-person lectures, boost the number of contact hours. In terms of their learning, actually that probably wouldn't have quite the impact that I think uh, people think it that it simply demand more contact hours would be. So how we're able to engage students in a more uh, nuanced way to actually help drive uh, reform uh, across the higher education sector. And then to the other key question I just wanted to touch on briefly is uh, this point about the purpose of higher education. <coughs> it sounds a massive and enormous topic, and of course it is. But it does feel like when, say in the early 60s, about 6% of the population went to university, we had quite a clear idea of what university was for. 43% of people now go to university, and significantly more in many other European countries. Have we, as part of that, massive expansion ever really stopped to think about what higher education is for and what it's trying to do. And that comes back to, to your point in terms of <coughs> the, the blurring between higher education <coughs> universities and colleges, uh, tertiary, tertiary education more generally. What will employers expect from universities is actually going away for a three-year residential course uh, for an undergraduate degree. The best way to train of the managers of the future, whatever, whatever the particular needs of the employers are, or will actually the demands of employers start to become a little bit more uh, pressing in terms of what they expect from institutions. So will some institutions focus a little bit more on maybe career professional development, so some shorter courses particularly aimed at uh, bits of uh, uh, professional development uh, for staff. So the questions around what higher education is for and what it's trying to achieve, I think is certainly something that as we look to the future, it's always quite useful to sort of sometimes stop and take stock about uh, what it is we're actually, uh, where it is we actually want to get to. 
The other thing I was just uh, asked to say was around uh, a message to the global student leaders. Uh, all very grand, but uh, I think sort of <coughs> the this, this key point is around this this message around how uh, students engage in shaping uh, their learning, and I think. Feels certainly in this country, and also uh, speaking to, to colleagues from across, particularly across European uh, higher education systems, it feels as though there is increased emphasis on the role that students play in developing higher education policy, or indeed engaged in shaping their learning more, more generally. And I suppose sort of the key challenge, I think, for the student, unit, student leaders is being able to do that in a way which actually enhances the educational experience rather than simply, as I say, approaching that sort of fairly uh, sort of consumerist, uh, we expect this as opposed to actually how, how, do we have, how do we move towards a student-centered learning approach whereby actually it's the learning that matters rather than simply getting value for money, whatever the phrase happens to be. I think actually that applies equally to today as well. It's sometimes quite easy to sort of talk about sort of student engagement and so on, but actually even in terms of a conference uh, like today, you, you get out of it what you put into it. So in terms of engaging in the debates, engaging in the, uh, <coughs> uh, there's, the there's the hashtag, engaging in the, the Twitter discussions, uh, hashtag WS2013, uh, actually sort of over lunch, over the coffee breaks, using these opportunities to, to speak to people, speak to people that you wouldn't, speak to people that you don't know. Speak to people from different countries that will give you a chance to think about things in a slightly different way. And that, I think, is the exciting thing about events like today, is actually having a chance to, to meet new people and actually discuss the, the, the big questions of, uh, of higher education. What's what higher education for? What impact will internationalisation have? What impact will technology or, uh, or, the, or the market have in higher education? So hopefully this will be a chance for you to, uh, to really get to grips with the, uh, at least thinking about what the questions are. You probably won't get to uh, the answer, or if you do, then let me know and I can uh, go and speak to David Willett so we can sort it all out. But, uh, uh, but yeah, at least think, think about what you can get out of today. And I say, the more you put into it, the more you get out of it. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, see you all later.